Good morning, everybody. This is Tuesday morning, May 3rd. We still don't have a release of visas. But I'm feeling good today. I'm feeling good today. I got a whole bunch of acceptances on these different uh, family petitions that I filed. And I even got a military parole in pl place approved in a record three months. Um, I-601A waivers are getting completed. I'm feeling good in May. I hope you're feeling good. Let's just talk about uh, what we're seeing in both the H-2B space and the family processing space after the break. Hey, welcome back everybody. My name is Damien DeNoble. This is Law Great, the channel where I give you reliable information to help you make better decisions and avoid costly mistakes. I'm gonna try something different today. I wanna to be able to give you more videos throughout the week. So one thing that you're gonna see on this channel is we've gotten several requests for a live show. I've been thinking about how to do that. Um, one of the things that um, I think I have to do if I do live shows is limit it to certain topics. So I'm thinking a live show on certain family petitions. Um, we might even break that down into kind of consular versus non-consular. Um, a live show on H-2B visas, a live show on EB-3s, a live show on 601 waivers, and I'll announce them ahead of time so that if you wanna get some free questions answered, you can actually just jump on the line and um, by having a pretty concentrated topic, you'll hear other people that are going through the same process and that way you'll get more out of it, right? Because potentially many more of the questions that uh, we discuss will be relevant to you. Um, so I'll be announcing that on the channel. And the other thing I wanna do is just give you a little more vlogging. You know, I know vlogging is very old school, uh, but I feel like every day something happens that's pretty random. I don't have a good necessarily topic to fit it into every day, but working in a law office, things always happen. So for example, um, we had a parole in place approved in three months. Now I applied for this parole in place in the Connecticut USCIS office, which is out of Hartford. The last parole in place that I did was out of North Carolina. Remember, I moved to Connecticut from North Carolina in 2021, and that one took 14 months. And so it was just interesting to see the difference. And one of the things that it makes me think about is uh, the most common question that any immigration advocate, attorney, paralegal, BIA representative gets. That question is, my friend had so-and-so application, which is mine, I think. It's like mine, I think. Are you sure? Yeah, I think. Anyway, no, it's like exactly the same. Did you ask? Uh, no, but it's exactly the same. So my friend who has the exact same application, exact same, their process only took two months. Why have I been waiting for a year? Honestly, uh, you know, when you ask that question, there's a few assumptions. Number one, we're not working on your case as best as we can because why would the friend have a two month approval window while our window is, well, we're still waiting 14 months later. And, and the second thing is, um, I, I don't have enough information to tell you, okay? Because sometimes there might be a legitimate reason why somebody had theirs approved quickly. Uh, maybe there, there was some sort of emergency petition. Most likely they're in a completely different category. They might be in a completely different state. Where you are matters. Okay, so if you're applying for something out of California or Texas, your application time, wait time is going to be a lot longer, right? Um, than for the same application in a different state. Likewise, this parole in place. For whatever reason, parole in place, which is done through the local USCIS center. So if you are near, in North Carolina, for example, if you are near the Raleigh-Durham USCIS, you apply there. If you're near the Charlotte USCIS, you apply there. In Connecticut, there's one USCIS in Hartford, so we apply there. And you can take that for every state. Every one of those uh, centers is going to have a different processing time because they're going to have a different procedure, a different number of officers that are assigned to parole in place cases. And so the times are just going to be naturally different three months versus 14 months. So my answer always when clients ask me, why does, is this taking so long? I always say, I don't know. I don't know anything about that case. I don't know why they're filing it. I just know we're doing the very best that we can on your case. If there's a reason to try and expedite it, we've outlined those for you at the beginning of representation. So if you think you're sick, if you have an emergency need to travel somewhere, uh, if if you have something else that's, that's very narrow and very unique uh, that constitutes an emergency, let's talk about it and maybe we can figure out a way to expedite things if you qualify, right? Uh, but most of the time I don't know, but that was excellent news. So I just wanted to share that and then give you that little tip. 
okay, in line with this sort of new format that I wanna do. The second thing that's on my mind that I'm getting a lot of calls about is these H2B workers. We're still waiting for these 35,000 workers to be released. Um, as a reminder, at the start of April, Department of Homeland Security said they're issuing 35,000 additional H2B workers. We were super happy because this announcement came fully like a month and a half earlier than other announcements, but we're still waiting. And so this week, what the internal chatter was uh, uh, indicating, this is according to the Seasonal Employment Alliance, which you should follow on Twitter. They're right there. Go ahead and give them a follow. Join them if you're an employer and you can. Uh, they're saying, hey, we were supposed to get a publication of the final rule uh, with the registration office. Um, and then we were supposed to have the final rule published in the federal register uh, by the end of this week, Thursday, Friday. We still think that's gonna be the case, even though we're here at Tuesday. So here's what you need to be doing. You need to be contact, you need to have your job orders translated into whatever language. First of all, you're going to be recruiting in. So if you're recruiting workers from Latin American countries and their primary language is Spanish, or if you're uh, uh, in a country with a different language, perhaps Portuguese, you need to translate your job board into that. You should start contacting recruiting workers now. We're here fully planning, waiting to file USCIS applications as soon as that federal register drops. Okay, let's not worry about when it's dropping, but just get ready. So get ready to do all your USCIS filing. Uh, that means you also need to have your Department of Labor, Labor certification fully certified, which means you've turned in a recruitment report and you've gotten uh, fully certified, not just approved, fully certified, okay? So if you don't know what I'm talking about and you need help, just let me know. The last thing that's on my mind is, is kind of, it's, it's odd, it's different. Um, so here, this is that new, this is that new format. So I, I read this article uh, in Vanity Fair by a writer named James Pogue on a uh, movement, on a political movement uh, in the United States uh, that's, that's a new conservative movement that has some roots in Trumpism, but it has this desire to create an intellectual basis uh, for this new conservative thought. And believe it or not, one of the key principal ideas uh, in this uh, movement is uh, is the sort of restoration of a monarchy, which is a nicer way of, of saying creating some sort of state where there's a dicta dictator or authoritarian that can then take that power to remake and recalibrate the United States into something that is functional. Because the idea is that right now we can't govern ourselves. And it's interesting because uh, under this, you have several evolving policy uh, positions, but one of them is this idea that uh, all legal immigration should be completely slashed for some period of time, because the reason that they want, uh, this movement wants a monarchy, is to reestablish, one of the reasons, reestablish uh, a national identity, some sort of sense of shared culture and purpose. Now, I don't wanna debate the merits of that. I'm, I'm not going to get political. That's that's not what, I, what I'm here for. But one of the things that I track uh, as an immigration attorney um, is, and just as a citizen, are aware of the evolving ideas coming from that are shaping the United States, that are shaping our country. And, and this is one of them. I, I think it's going to have power. You have key figures like J.D. Vance, who's running for Senate in Ohio. Um, you have uh, uh, James, uh, was a Peter Thiel, who's a $8 billion man that funds a lot of conservative causes. Um, th this has sticking power, right? Because you have money and, and you have very national figures that are part of this. What does that mean for immigration? So again, I've been very clear that I am not, uh, quote unquote, uh, an optimist on the future of the kind of progressive vision for immigration in the United States in the near term. I think immigration is going to continue to stay low and there's high potential if Democrats lose the fight for the White House in 2024, that, um, or in 2022, excuse me, that they're also gonna lose the White House in 2024 because you're gonna be left with uh, essentially an isolated executive for two years. And traditionally when that happens, if you don't have a really strong uh, presidential personality like a, like a Barack Obama, Bill Clinton were, you're, you're going to lose the White House. And so I anticipate that there's going to be a return to these restrictive policies in 2024. But what I'm interested in is, are we going to get um, kind of this really blunt, uh, harsh, unthinking Trump as Stephen Miller approach to it, where they just try to burn down every agency and and uh, you know kill immigration by a thousand cuts, or are you going to have something that is um, on the surface seems a lot 
more thought out, but effectively does the same thing where it cuts off immigration totally, putting us in line with many countries across the world, our near peers uh, like China and an increasing number of uh, countries in the EU, not to mention countries on the African continent. Are we, are we gonna be there? And so I, I'm thinking about uh, that in terms of our family clients and we are trying to make sure that the clients that we have now that, we're, that we get them through the process before 2024. And I'm thinking about that in the context of this Roe v. Wade uh, leaked uh, decision memo that came out today which is unprecedented and there was you know 35 year intellectual movement to get from the passing of Roe v. Wade to its apparent imminent repeal today and it's a reminder that everything that we take for granted in this country as being a foundation for example immigration uh, from all over the world is not actually forever it's it's a state of things that's for a while and uh, we have to keep that in mind um, those of us going through the immigration system helping other others navigate it uh, because our strategy can't be to wait forever. It can't be to just kind of go with, with the flow. It can't be to put off all these petitions. I really do believe that there is a small window uh, where uh, those who are going through the system are going to be experiencing it in the way that the past you know, 30 years of immigrants have experienced it. So that's on my mind. I don't know if I've said that well. You know, we, with the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s, also ushered in a revolution in immigration. It made the country, it made the country much more diverse. Um, it's also become a, you know, uh, a fire rod. I don't know what the, it's become a rod that attracts the thunder of the political world. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a big issue, you know, just like the right to abortion um, is and will continue to be. So that's what I'm thinking about this morning in the context of um, this question, why is my application going faster? Why, the, why is this one going that way? Because the system has that built in. It has differences built in. In the context of waiting for H2Bs, the system is massive. We're waiting, it's imperfect. Uh, you know, and, and Roe v. Wade decision and this article that I shared ties into that because not only is the system imperfect, but it's also not forever. And we have to be okay. We have to be okay with imperfect. We have to be okay with waiting. We have to be okay with uncertainty when we're going through this uh, immigration journey. So I hope this is helpful. It's wonderful to see you and I hope to see you another time. It's super helpful to me if you share and subscribe, let other people know. And again, we'll be hosting those live shows. Don't forget going forward, if you're this far in, then uh, it's good to remind you because I bet you'll show up. All right, thank you so much. Yeah.